I'm, I'm reading from uh, Gilead uh, two passages that have to do with his falling in love with his wife. My John Ames, the elderly pastor who's writing, writing this letter, memoir. Um, the, there are some names that you will have to know if you haven't read the book. Um, he mentions Louise. Louise is his first wife who was a, a friend of his in his childhood who died um, very young in the, in the birth of their first child and who left him a widower for, for decades, many decades. Um, Rebecca is the name of the daughter who died as an infant. Um, Boughton is the name of uh, his childhood friend, a Presbyterian minister uh, with whom he's very close. And uh, Soapy is the name of his cat. My father always preached from notes, and I wrote my sermons out word for word. There are boxes of them in the attic, a few recent years of them in stacks in the closet. I've never gone back to them to see if they were worth anything, if I actually said anything. Pretty nearly my whole life's work is in those boxes, which is an amazing thing to reflect on. I could look through them, maybe find a few I would want you to have. I'm a little afraid of them. I believe I may have worked over them as I did just to keep myself occupied. If someone came to the house and found me writing, generally he or she would go away, unless it was something pretty important. I don't know why solitude would be a bomb for loneliness, but that is how it always was for me in those days, and people respected me for all those hours I was up here working away in the study and for the books that used to come in the mail for me. Not so many, really, but more than I could afford. That's where some of the money went that I could have put aside for you. There was more to it, of course. For me, writing has always felt like praying, even when I wasn't writing prayers as I was often enough. You feel that you are with someone. I feel I am with you now, whatever that can mean, considering that you're only a little fellow now, and when you're a man, you might find these letters of no interest. Or they may, might never reach you for any number of reasons. Well, but how deeply I regret any sadness you have suffered and how grateful I am in anticipation of any good you have enjoyed. That is to say, I pray for you, and there's an intimacy in it. That's the truth. Your mother is respectful of my hours up here in the study. She's proud of my books. She was the one who actually called my attention to the number of boxes I have filled with my sermons and my prayers say, 50 sermons a year for 45 years, not counting funerals and so on, of which there have been a great many. 2,250. If they average 30 pages, that's 67,500 pages. Can that be right? I guess it is. I write in a small hand, too, as you know by now. Say, 300 pages make a volume. Then I've written 225 books, which puts me up there with Augustine and Calvin for quantity. That's amazing. I wrote almost all of it in the deepest hope and conviction, sifting my thoughts and choosing my words, trying to say what was true. And I'll tell you frankly, that was wonderful. I'm grateful for all those dark years, even though in retrospect they seem like a long, bitter prayer that was answered finally. Your mother walked into church in the middle of the prayer to get out of the weather, I thought at the time, because it was pouring. And she watched me with eyes so serious I was embarrassed to be preaching to her. As Boughton would say, I felt the poverty of my remarks. Sometimes I have loved the peacefulness of an ordinary Sunday. It is like standing in a newly planted garden after a warm rain. You can feel the silent and invisible life. All it needs from you is that you take care not to trample on it. And that was such a quiet day. Rain on the roof, rain against the windows, and everyone grateful since it seems we never do have quite enough rain. At times like that, I might not care particularly whether people are listening to whatever I have to say because I know what their thoughts are. Then if some stranger comes in, that very same peace can seem like somnolence and like dull habit, because that is how you're afraid it seems to her. 
If Rebecca had lived, she'd be 51, older than your mother is now by 10 years. For a long time, I used to think how it would be if she walked in that door, what I would not be ashamed at least to say in her hearing, because I always imagined her coming back from a place where everything is known and hearing my hopes and my speculations the way someone would who has seen the truth face to face and would know the full measure of my incomprehension. That was the sort of trick I played on myself to keep from taking doctrines and controversies too much to heart. I read so many books in those days, and I was always disputing in my mind with one or another of them, but I think I usually knew better than to take too much of that sort of thing into the pulpit. I believe, though, that it was because I wrote those sermons as if Rebecca might sometime walk in the door that I was somewhat prepared when your mother walked in, younger than Rebecca would have been, of course, but not very different from the way I saw her in my mind. It wasn't so much her appearance as it was the way she seemed as if she didn't belong there, and at the same time as if she were the only one of us all who really did belong there. I say this because there was a seriousness about her that seemed almost like a kind of anger, as though she might say, I came here from whatever unspeakable distance and from whatever unimaginable otherness just to oblige your prayers. Now say something with a little meaning in it. My sermon was like ashes on my tongue. And it wasn't that I hadn't worked on it either. I worked on all my sermons. I remember I baptized two infants that day. I could feel how intensely she watched. Both the creatures wept when I touched the water to their heads the first time, and I looked up, and there was just the look of stern amazement in her face that I knew would be there even before I looked up. And I felt like saying quite sincerely, if you know a better way to do this, I'd appreciate your telling me. (laughs) Then just six months later, I baptized her, and I felt like asking, what have I done? What does it mean? That was a question that came to me often, not because I felt less than certain I had done something that did mean something, but because no matter how much I thought and read and prayed, I felt outside the mystery of it. The tears ran down her face, dear woman. I'll never forget that, unless I forget everything, as so many of the old people do. It appears I at least won't live long enough to forget much that I haven't forgotten already, which is a good deal I know. I have thought about baptism over the years. Boughton and I have discussed it often. Now, this might seem a trivial thing to mention, considering the gravity of the subject, but I truly don't feel it is. We were very pious children from pious households in a fairly pious town, and this affected our behavior considerably. Once we baptized a litter of cats, They were dusty little barn cats, just steady on their legs, the kind of waifish creatures that live their anonymous lives, keeping the mice down, and have no interest in humans at all, except to avoid them. But the animals all seemed to start out sociable, so we were always pleased to find new kittens prowling out of whatever cranny their mother had tried to hide them in, as ready to play as we were. It occurred to one of the girls to swaddle them up in a doll's dress. There was only one dress, which was just as well since the cats could hardly tolerate a moment in it and would have, would, have, would have to have been unswaddled as soon as they were christened in any case. I myself moistened their brows, repeating the full Trinitarian formula. Their grim old crooked-tailed mother found us baptizing away by the creek and began carrying her babies off by the napes of their necks, one and then another, We lost track of which was which, but we were fairly sure that some of the creatures had been born away still in the darkness of paganism. (laughs) And that worried us a good deal. So finally I asked my father in the most offhand way imaginable, what exactly would happen to a cat if one were to, say, baptize it? He replied that the sacraments must always be treated and regarded with the greatest respect. That wasn't really an answer to my question. We did respect the sacraments, but we thought the whole world of those cats. I got his meaning, though, and I did no more baptizing until I was ordained. (laughs) Two or three of that litter were taken home by the girls and made into fairly respectable house cats. Louisa took a yellow one. She still had it when we were married. 
The others lived out their feral lives, indistinguishable from their kind. Whether pagan or Christian, no one could ever tell. She called her cat Sparkle for the white patch on its forehead. It disappeared finally. I suspect it got caught stealing rabbits, a sin to which it was much given, Christian cat that we knew it to be, stiff-jointed as it was by that time. One of the boys said she should have named it Sprinkle. He was a Baptist, a firm believer in total immersion, which those cats should have been grateful I was not. (laughs) He told us no effect at all could be achieved by our methods, and we could not prove him wrong. Our Soapy must be a distant relative. I still remember how those warm little brows felt under the palm of my hand. Everyone has petted a cat, but to touch one like that, with the pure intention of blessing it, is a very different thing. It stays in the mind. For years we would wonder what, from a cosmic viewpoint, we had done to them. It still seems to me to be a real question. There is a reality in blessing, which I take baptism to be primarily. It doesn't enhance the sacredness. It doesn't enhance sacredness, but it acknowledges it, and there is a power in that. I have felt it pass through me, so to speak. The sensation is of really knowing a creature. I mean really feeling its mysterious life and your own mysterious life at the same time. I don't wish to be urging the ministry on you, but there are some advantages to it you might not take into account if I did not point them out. Not that you have to be a minister to confer blessing. You are simply much more likely to find yourself in that position. It is a thing people expect of you. I don't know why there is so little about this aspect of the calling in the literature. Ludwig Feuerbach says a wonderful thing about baptism. I have it marked. He says, water is the purest, clearest of liquids. In virtue of this, its natural character, it is the image of the spotless nature of the divine spirit. In short, water has a significance in itself as water. It is, on, it is on account of its natural quality that it is consecrated and selected as the vehicle of the Holy Spirit. So far, there lies at the foundation of baptism a beautiful, profound, natural significance. Feuerbach is a famous atheist, but he is about as good on the joyful aspects of religion as anybody, and he loves the world. Of course, he thinks religion could just stand out of the way and let joy exist pure and undisguised. That is his one error, and it is significant. But he is marvelous on the subject of joy and also on its religious expressions. I had a dream once that Boughton and I were down at the river looking around in the shallows for something or other. When we were boys, it would have been tadpoles. And my grandfather stalked out of the trees in that furious way he had, scooped his hat full of water and threw it so a sheet of water came sailing toward us, billowing in the air like a veil and fell down over us. Then he put his hat back on his head and stalked off into the trees again and left us standing there in that glistening river, amazed at ourselves and shining like the apostles. I mention this because it seems to me transformations just that abrupt do occur in this life, and they occur unsought and unawaited, and they beggar your hopes and your deserving. This came to my mind as I was reflecting on the day I first saw your mother, that blessed rainy Pentecost. That morning, something began that felt to me as if my soul were being teased out of my body. That's a fact. I have never told you how all that came about, how we came to be married. And I learned a great deal from the experience, believe me. It enlarged my understanding of hope, just to know that such a transformation can occur. And it has greatly sweetened my imagination of death, odd as that may sound. Even though I told myself I had hardly noticed her that first morning, I spent the whole next week hoping she would come back. I rebuked myself considerably for forgetting to ask her name as she went out the door, thinking about it in terms of my obligations to strayed sheep and lost souls, which are expressions I never do use, even in my thoughts, and which I would certainly never have applied to her. One interesting aspect of the whole situation was that I simply could not be honest with myself, and I couldn't deceive myself either. It was terrible. I felt like such a fool. But you see, I was mindful of her youth and of my age, and I knew nothing about her, whether she might be married or not. 
So I couldn't admit to myself that I simply wanted to see her, to hear her voice again. She said, good morning, Reverend, that was all. But I remember trying to retain the sound of it, trying to hear it again in my mind. I'll tell you, if my grandfather did throw his mantle over me, so to speak, he did it long before I came into this world. The holiness of his life imputed a holiness to mine or to my vocation that I have tried to diminish as little as I could. I have tried to be careful of my reputation and also of my character. I have tried to keep the gospel before me as a standard for my life and my preaching, and yet there I was trying to write a sermon when all I really wanted to do was try to remember a young woman's face. If I had had this experience earlier in life, I would have been much wiser, much more compassionate. I really didn't understand what it was that made people who came to me so indifferent to good judgment, to common sense, or why they would say, I know, I know, when I urged a little reasonableness on them, and why it meant, it doesn't matter, I just don't care. That's what the saints and the martyrs say. And I know now that it is passion that moves them to their prodigal renunciations. I might seem to be comparing something great and holy with a minor and ordinary thing, that is, the love of God with mortal love, but I just don't see them as separate things at all. If we can be divinely fed with a morsel and divinely blessed with a touch, then the terrible pleasure we find in a particular face can certainly instruct us in the nature of the very grandest love. I, de I devoutly believe this to be true. I remember in those days loving God for the existence of love and being grateful to God for the existence of gratitude right down in the depths of my misery. I realized many things I am at a loss to express. And of course, those feelings become milder with time, which is a mercy. Louisa and I were expected to marry almost from childhood, so nothing had prepared me to find myself thinking day and night about a complete stranger, a woman much too young, probably a married woman. That was the first time in my life I ever felt I could be snatched out of my character, my calling, my reputation, as if they could just fall away like a dry husk. I had never before felt that everything I thought I was amounted to, the clothes on my back and the books on my shelves and the calendar I kept full of obligations waiting and obligations fulfilled. As I have said, it was a foretaste of death, at least of dying, and why should that seem strange? Passion is the word we use, after all. Well, it got much worse. She was there every Sunday but one, and I wrote all those sermons, I confess, with the thought of pleasing her, impressing her. I struggled not to look at her too often or too long, but I would convince myself nevertheless that I saw disappointment of some kind in her face, and then I would spend the next week praying right down on my knees that she would give me another chance. I felt so ridiculous. But I would speak to the Lord about it just the same, asking him to strengthen me in exercising my pastoral responsibilities, and not a word I said was true because I was really just a foolish old man asking the Almighty to indulge his foolishness, and I knew it at the time. And my prayers were answered beyond anything I could have thought to ask. A wife and a child, I would never have believed it. There was the one terrible Sunday that she wasn't there. How dead and sad and airless that morning was, how shabby we all seemed, and the church too. Of course, my sermon that day was about welcoming the stranger, because you might be welcoming an angel unawares. I hated reading it. <laughs> I felt everyone in the room knew I was standing there making a confession of my folly. It seemed inevitable to me that she would never come back, so I spent a dreadful week resigning myself to the smallness of my life, the drabness of it, and thanking the Lord that I had never made a complete fool of myself, had never held her hand by the door and attempted conversation, though I had rehearsed in my mind what I might say to her and had even written it out. <laughs> it must be said also that I hated myself for a fool that I had not held her hand, had not spoken to her. 
I spent that week trying to make myself describe what it was that attracted me to her so strongly, somehow thinking that because I could not, the attraction might be dispelled. And I spent the week missing her as if she were the only friend I had ever had on earth. And I also gave some thought to the practical problem of learning her name and finding out where she lived, <laughs> thinking to excuse this as a pastoral concern. What humiliation. The next Sunday, there she was again. I was miserable with relief, afraid I might laugh for no reason, afraid I might look at her too long, trying to remind myself she was a stranger, though she had been my dearest and most inward thought for weeks, and that I must not startle her with some unaccountable familiarity. I had been to the barber, and I was wearing a new shirt, since it seemed only prudent to suppose that my constant, passionate, and most unworthy prayers might be answered. And I'd made a little experiment with hair tonic. <laughs> Boughton met me in the road, as he often did in those days, and he looked at me and chuckled. And I thought, what an utter and transparent fool I am. When she left the church that day, I did hold her hand, and I did say a few words. We missed you last week. It's good to have you here again. Oh, she said, and she blushed and looked away, as if the kindness had surprised her, though it was only the most basic and routine preacherly kindness, that being all I felt I could allow myself under the circumstances. I am sick with love. That's scripture. It makes me laugh to remember this. I turned to the Bible in my crisis, as I have always done, and the text I chose was the Song of Songs. I might have learned from it that such miseries as mine were beautiful in the Lord's sight if I had been younger and if I had known that your mother was not a married woman. As it was, the beauty of the poems just hurt my feelings. Oh, but the next week I held her hand and I told her we had a Bible study that met on Sunday night and she would be most welcome. Then I went home and prayed that my wiliness would be rewarded <laughs> and shaved again and tried to read until evening. I walked up early to the church, and there she was, waiting for me by the steps, hoping she might have a word with me. At that point, I began to suspect, as I have from time to time, that Grace has a grand laughter in it. She confided to this unworthy old swain with perfume in his hair, that she came to me seeking baptism. No one seen to it for me when I was a child, she said. I've been feeling the lack of it. Oh, the sad, stark purity of her look. I said, well, my dear, we will take care of you. And then, very conversationally, I asked her if she had family in the area. She shook her head and said very softly, I don't have family at all. I felt a surge of sadness for her, and still in my wretched heart, I thanked the Lord. <laughs> so I instructed your mother in the doctrines of the faith, and in due course I did indeed baptize her, and I became happily accustomed to the sight of her, her quiet presence, and I began to give thanks that I had lived through the worst of my passion without making a ruin and a desolation of my good name, without running after her in the street, as I nearly did once when I saw her step out of the grocery store and walk away. I scared myself so badly that time I broke into a sweat. That's how strong the impulse was. And I was 67. But I did always act consistently with my great respect for her youth and her loneliness, I can promise you that. I took great care about it. I thought it best to recruit some of the kindest older women to sit through her instruction with her, and I believe that made her shy about speaking, which I regretted very much. Two or three of the ladies had pronounced views on points of doctrine, particularly sin and damnation, which they never learned from me. <laughs> I blame the radio for sowing a good deal of confusion where theology is concerned, and television is worse. You can spend 40 years teaching people to be awake to the fact of mystery, and then some fellow with no more theological sense than a jackrabbit gets himself a radio ministry, and all your work is forgotten. I do wonder where it will end. 
But even that was for the best, because one of the ladies, Veda Dyer, got herself into a considerable excitement talking about flames. That is perdition. So I felt obliged to take down the institutes and read them the passage on the lot of the reprobate about how their torments are figuratively expressed to us by physical things, unquenchable fire and so on, to express how wretched it is to be cut off from all fellowship with God. I have the passage in front of me. It is alarming, certainly, but it isn't ridiculous. I told them, if you want to inform yourself as to the nature of hell, don't hold your hand in a candle flame, just ponder the meanest, most desolate place in your soul. They all did ponder a good while, and I did too, listening to the evening wind in the cicadas. I came near alarming myself with the thought of the loneliness stretching ahead of me and the new bitterness of it, and how I hated the secretiveness and the renunciation that honor and decency required of me and that common sense enforced on me. But when I looked up, your mother was watching me, smiling a little, and she touched my hand, and she said, You'll be just fine. How soft her voice is. That there should be such a voice in the whole world, and that I should be the one to hear it, it seemed to me then, and seems to me now, an unfathomable grace. She began to come to the house when some of the other women did, to take the curtains away to wash, to defrost the icebox, and then she started coming by herself to tend the gardens. She made them very fine and prosperous, and one evening when I saw her there, out by the wonderful roses, I said, How can I repay you for all this? And she said, You ought to marry me. And I did. This morning, a splendid dawn passed over our house on its way to Kansas. This morning, Kansas rolled out of its sleep into a sunlight, sunlight grandly announced, proclaimed throughout heaven, one more of the very finite number of days that this old prairie has been called Kansas or Iowa. But it has all been one day, that first day. Light is constant, we just turn over in it. So every day is, in fact, the self-same evening and morning. My grandfather's grave turned into the light, and the dew on his weedy little mortality patch was glorious. Thou wast in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond. While I'm thinking of it, when you are an old man like I am, you might think of writing some sort of account of yourself as I am doing. In my experience of it, age has a tendency to make one's sense of self Harder to maintain, less robust in some ways. Why do I love the thought of you old? That first twinge of arthritis in your knee is a thing I imagine with all the tenderness I felt when you showed me your loose tooth. Be diligent in your prayers, old man. I hope you will have seen more of the world than I ever got around to seeing, only myself to blame. And I hope you will have read some of my books. And God bless your eyes and your hearing also and, of course, your heart. I wish I could help you carry the weight of many years, but the Lord will have that fatherly satisfaction. <laughs>